Welcome to Thoughtful Conversation, uh, where we talk to interesting people to either maybe challenge some of your thoughts and ideas, or um, just to hear from people that you might relate to, or a bit of both. Okay, so we're here with Dr. Oscar Duke, um, obviously a qualified doctor since 2010, is that right? That's right, yeah. Uh, right, um, but also broadcasters. So I think recently you did a program about vaccination, um, but also has just had a second baby. So we're, we're mostly talking about the book, How to Be a Dad, which um, Ultimate Guide to Pregnancy, Birth and Dirty Nappies, which you write from two perspectives, which I think is brilliant because obviously the, the doctor perspective, but also it's slightly different as a dad, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think that was the whole reason that I wanted to write it was that I thought, well, when I, I remember sitting in an antenatal class thinking, my gosh, I have been to medical school, I've done jobs in paediatrics, I've worked in obstetrics and gynaecology as part of my training, and still I don't know half of this stuff. So I said, <laughs> if, if even the doctors don't know, then I'm sure dads who have, do something completely different from the medical sphere have, have got even more to learn. So it felt like a book that, that needed to be written for the dads particularly, because I think it's such an important role that dads can play in the whole process. Obviously they aren't the key person, um, but they are, in sort of you know ninety percent of cases, a big a big supporter of that key person. And do you think it's changed how much information dads want to know as well? Because there's some real. I mean, the birth section in particular. I I learned some stuff, and I've had three kids, but it's really detailed. And I think it needs to be because otherwise it's su such a shock. Because it you know if you don't know what's happening, and and even just the the fact that there's different sections of a birth and all that stuff, that's quite basic some of it but do, do you think I suppose it's two questions do you think dads are more interested in finding out all that now and playing yeah I think on? I think generally now we have such an amazing access to information you, know, you can find any journal you want from the Royal College of Obstetricians or if you, just by using Google yeah. and I made a documentary for ITV a couple of years ago about Dr. Google and the kind of dangers of doing that and met lots of people who'd gone down these kind of horrible rabbit holes by searching for stuff and finding non reputable sources and definitely around kind of birth and parenting. There's a huge amount of amazing information and also loads of chat and forums that can terrify people. So I was really keen that there was a kind of formal in a chatty way, but formal in terms of the rigor of the science and the evidence behind it, that it was all accurate. Yeah. Um, and I think people do want to have, you know, I think people do want to have that. And I always feel that knowledge is power in those situations. I remember having both my children, but particularly the first, I was really struck being in the delivery room by the fact that I felt quite familiar with that environment. You know, I've spent years working on hospital wards, so drips, bleeping machines, people running in and out. It all feels almost kind of like a, a second home to me. Mm -hmm. But lots of dads I spoke to were absolutely terrified by the whole experience. You know, they don't you don't really know what's going on. There's a person you love more than anything and, and probably some something about to arrive that you're going to maybe love even more than that. Um, and you don't want anything to go wrong. And and there is a potential for for things to go wrong or at least things for thing, things to feel quite stressful, even if they're actually you know well under control as, as they normally are and so I, I want to be able to have that information I think if you can understand what's happening and what could potentially go wrong and what will then be done about it then you kind of can hopefully at least be uh, swimming on the surface even if you're kind of paddling frantically underneath yeah well and you'd say in the book about one of the key kind of guidance would be to try and stay calm because obviously if if your partner is stressing and thrashing about and going oh god what's happening but obviously you're as a woman you're trying to stay focused and and do your thing and you need them to be i think i needed my husband to be quite silent actually <laughs> he i think to... often yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the partners are just I mean, just shut up just sit there and shut <laughs> up it's, it's easier said than done though i mean you know i wrote that book after having had my first or around the time of having my first and then two weeks ago we had our, our second and um, there, was, there was a point during the labour where they said, no, now we're just going to wait. And the epidural was in. We let, so, you know, you can just have a little rest, having been there for hours. So I'd taken out my contact lens and I was in this sort of reclining chairs. Um, and, and suddenly Ray woke up and was like, I, I just pushed the baby's coming. And I was sort of half asleep with no contact lenses <laughs> in the dark. And I, I was definitely not cool and calm at that point, like, trying to find a button to call the midwife. Like, I, I do not want to deliver my own baby. 
No, I think my uh, I think my brother in law the first time they had a baby he realized he was it went on, it went on longer than he thought it was going to do and he was hungry was his overriding memory of being hungry so with his second when she went into labor at home he started making pizza <laughs> she's like we need to go and he's like hang on hang on I've been here before we'll be hungry I need calories yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, oh, I, there's so many stories of the like the things that men and w people do when it comes down to it in that kind of usually quite funny. When you look back at it, it's funny anyway. Yeah, I mean, we've always had like this bag completely filled with snacks yeah. and I eat all of them and Ray doesn't want any of them. And that's not just because I'm a <laughs> bad, horrible husband. <laughs> she, she just genuinely lets you that as soon as I'm in any kind of discomfort with her, I just don't want to eat at all. Yeah. Um, so I think you can go one of you know many ways can't yeah, you? you just you just never know that's the other thing you and, yeah. and each each pregnancy and each birth can be completely different as well of what you want at that time um, and your priorities change I think you know having it's been interesting having a second child because then you're very focused on the first and mm -hmm. when you're having your first child you don't have that worry of you know who's going to take the first child how are they going to be looked after are they going to be okay how do they feel about number two coming along so there's there's a whole sort of different dynamic that comes once you once you add another one into the mix as well I think that was one of my overriding worries was for my first even when they came to the hospital and they brought him in and I was like, I was really emotional actually, because it was, fe it felt like I was che cheating on him or, you know, like going, oh, you just don't know how they're going to end. He was two. How old is your, is Rory? Uh, Rory's three. So, okay, yeah, yeah, so she was, you know, very excited about exactly. the new arrival, but also, yeah, it's a, it's a slightly nervous moment, I think, isn't it? I think, yeah. well, for mums and dads, but I think yeah, particularly my wife and, you know, that you sort of, and then your time is instantly divided, isn't it? And you suddenly feel like, oh, I'm not giving my time to this person or that person. Yeah. But then I think you have to, you know, I often say to my patients, well, you also have to think of the benefits that you're bringing by giving them a, a sibling. That's an amazing thing to have as well. So you know, it's, yeah. you win some and you lose some. You do. And I think it's where the role of dad, again, I remember my husband was like could take the my toddler when I had two of swimming whilst I was home with the baby and having to get my head around that and be like actually that's okay because he's with his dad and he's you know he's still having he's still having a lovely time he's unaware really of what's going on while I was at home with the baby and not feeling guilty I think yeah that I think it can then become the battle of who's having the easier ride can't it is yeah. it easier <laughs> to have the newborn baby or the toddler yeah definitely <laughs> Um, You're either yeah. battling with breastfeeding or battling to get them into their pajamas. Yeah. Pro no. Probably nobody wins. <laughs> no, no, and that's a big, a big thing. I think one of the things you write in the book: um, never reassuringly blame hormones, and this is in particular referencing pregnancy and the fact that hormones can be can make you quite erratic and ragey and all those other things. And I really liked that. Um, because that's so true. I mean, it's the same, to be honest, for periods as well. When someone goes, oh, now, well, that makes sense because it's your time of the month or whatever. And it's like, no, these are real feelings. <laughs> uh, I think that's really good advice for, for men. Yeah, and, and they are real feelings. And, and they probably are at least contributed to by these hormonal changes. But I think, um, yeah, mentioning that, particularly around the time of I, I suppose when you see it the most is in labor when you have that period of transition where um just as just before you start the sort of pushing phase of, of giving birth the, you know, the hormones are kind of at their peak and that's when lots of women do all of those stories that you hear about you know kind of punching the someone in the face or biting their partner's hand or go just deciding they can't do it and just upping and wanting to leave and then realizing that they're attached to all these drips and they've got to <laughs> Or, or whatever they might be doing and uh, and so th there's a huge element that is controlled by hormones but I think um, just supporting quietly and never broaching that subject is quite good advice for men who are involved in any way yeah. periods as well yeah yeah all, all of these <laughs> I think uh, no I think that was that first bit of having the bait when when the babies had arrived i found yeah the emotions and the rage i, I had quite, quite got quite angry quite a lot and um, my husband had to work out that he wasn't dealing with me as normal me it took him a while to realize that it was obviously there was lots of other things going on including hormones and feelings that were brought on from having a baby and feeling out of control or whatever it was and he he was like once i realized that had changed and that I wasn't necessarily dealing with Steph as I know her, 
rather than reacting to it and kind of going, oh, well, I think you're being a bit unreasonable, <laughs> which just doesn't help anyone, to be honest. It is really difficult. And I think all of that is in the context as well of everybody being sleep deprived, yeah. you know, both man and woman or anybody who's been involved, anyone who lives in the house probably is sleep deprived uh, around that time. And that also doesn't help your mental health. So you get this sort of hormone hit. And what else is really interesting, I did a documentary for Radio 4 last year about the hormonal changes that they are now starting to find happen in dads as well. Mm. And so th there's quite good evidence now that after you become a father for the first time, your testosterone levels drop, and that's meant to be a kind of primitive mechanism to stop you straying off and having loads more children straight away or make you more nurturing. Um, and they've done, they're doing some really interesting studies looking at testosterone levels and when they come down, how your nurturing behavior and your empathy and your support for your child is meant to go up. Right. And, and and so there's actually some school of thought now that men's mental health and of course you know, postnatal depression can happen in both mums and dads mm -hmm. um, is is and it's often thought to be related to these hormonal changes which obviously we knew were happening in in new mums yeah. but only fairly recently have we discovered that actually men go through those hormonal changes as well obviously not to such a great extent they're not having to have hormones to start milk coming out of the nipples or something like that but mm -hmm. they have got these changes and there's now some thought that that might be responsible for the the psychological changes as well so, so definitely I mean everything we do is controlled by our our hormones you know and and psychology and physical symptoms are so strongly linked as well I was you know, people never believe it when you say well I think the tummy pain might be coming from your the fact that you're very stressed at the minute and actually if you sort of Go back a few steps and think well if you're nervous then the hairs on the back of your neck stand on end or if you are embarrassed then your face goes red we know that there's a link between psychological symptoms and physical symptoms but we're not always sort of happy to accept it because they're sometimes a bit hard to understand why those things happen that's so true actually and in kids as well when they'll say i've got a tummy ache and quite often i think at a certain age i know my daughter it was more that she was anxious about something but she didn't know how she didn't know she was anxious she didn't know how to express that she was anxious yeah. um, and we'd all accept that if you had a big interview the next morning you might have diarrhea beforehand or something like that. you know yeah. these are our kind of physical manifestations of how you're feeling within your mind so yeah. it, it's really common for those things to happen and no more so than you know it's just a triple whammy isn't it really pregnancy particularly for a woman because you've got all the physical things that are happening all the physical changes then the physical effects of birth and the hormones and then the sleep deprivation as well yeah. and that can be a kind of yeah. catastrophic event if you're not yeah, really actually, careful it's really interesting because if if there's then an impact on men i suppose i've probably been like well you're okay it, it, you know i need looking after or and thought more about women but how what like do you get you've had lots of men or if you identify if you start to identify it more I suppose with men coming in who you and what do you do if a, if you if you detect that a man maybe has got kind of postnatal depression yeah you're you're right we said we shouldn't take away from the woman who in in this situation is it's doing loads of stuff though, isn't it? but, because but, that, that's only just been rec really it's quite recent yeah no it is and and I think men you know luckily there is less stigma now attached not not completely perfect but there is less stigma attached to talking about mental health mm -hmm. and i think it's really important for men of all ages and you know we see you know high suicide rates in men with depression yeah. so it's yeah. really important to kind of address that and, and luckily that is happening more and i think i do see it, you know as a gp now more men who are happy to come and talk about that or maybe not happy to come and talk about it but have been pushed into doing so and, and then do open up about it. And I remember just before my first child was born, a guy of similar age to me, you know, you often sort of then relate even more coming in and saying he'd had his first baby and actually he was feeling really low and it felt like it had ruined his life and it had ruined his relationship with his partner. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God, I'm literally having a child next week. Um, and, uh, and, and it wasn't until I said to him that I think you are suffering with some postnatal depression here that he was, you could see the relief sort of come over his face because he just thought he was a sort of bad person and didn't like his child and was sort of questioning his morals and feeling really, really down. And to sort of be given that label of a, of a mental health disorder, which therefore there was a treatment for, um, it, it was a huge, huge relief for him. And what and, would the treatment be? What would, what's the first kind of things that you advise? 
So the first thing is to make sure that it's that you identify that there's something going on, and and that can just be you know, anxiety, something as simple as anxiety, but obviously that can have a huge impact. I think at least a third of men, maybe up to two thirds of men, after after the birth of a child, feel that their anxiety is significantly increased. About one in ten men um, have sort of more formal postnatal depression, so you're feeling low, lots of, I mean loss of energy and not being able to sleep is, is a are sort of features of depression anyway and, and obviously they just come as part of the being a new parent so yeah. you're, you're sort of you're, you're on the on the cusp on a knife edge anyway a lot of the time um, and so I think the first thing is to identify and then the treatments are really very similar as they would be for anxiety or depression at any other time in life so it can either be a sort of talking therapy and psychological therapy which is really helpful um, or or if you need it and medications to help with that as well yeah i think it's um something that i've just was saying i discussed in a previous conversation was um around how men's role has changed and so the expectation on men and, and I've, I've said before like my mum will talk about how amazing my dad was because he got up in the night whereas i had complete expectation that my husband would be getting up in the night i would you know i would be at the birth and all those things and that role has, in a relatively short space of time, has changed significantly. And I think it must be quite confusing to know what to do. So, as you say, you, you're putting you're putting the woman first and her what she's done and what she's been through. But equally, what is the man's role? Because it isn't now just provide and everything else will get taken care of. Or there's not necessarily family nearby who are going to step in to cover all the other bits. So it's a lot more pressure, I would say. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's it's tricky because rightly we don't have those defined roles anymore. And and you see that with with lot I see that with lots of patients as well. That, you know, and it can be something kind of social or, or financial as well. You know, sometimes I've had patients where actually their partner who's just given birth is the main breadwinner in the family, and now they've got sort of feelings of guilt because they're you know historically told they should be the provider as dad, and actually, you know, they've been providing in all sorts of ways, but maybe not financially. And now mum's perhaps not going to work so much. And she if she had a higher income, that's become a problem for their relationship or for the family. Mm -hmm. And so I think there are all sorts of different sort of the blurring of those roles is fantastic. And I and in a way, that's one of the reasons I wanted to write the book is that I, I believe really strongly, I guess I'm a, a strong feminist, um, and, but I, I also really believe that we have to, if, if we want women, which we should do, to, to have all of those rights and equal opportunities, we actually have to support men to be able to have opportunities in kind of areas that perhaps stereotypically they weren't given before. Yeah, and that, that's, it's a massive change. I think that was what's becoming clear. I think you quite often have conversations going on among women or conversations going on among men and there actually needs to be a joint conversation because it's because it because both roles have to change and give and gain but it's yeah it's it's complicated one but I, I'm sure must have a huge impact on like when you talk about levels of suicide or um or and postnatal depression in men and that kind of thing it, it because it's confusing I suppose not that it was necessarily better when they had to go out and provide but it's just change no, you're right, and 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 it does mean that often now dads are doing a lot of the different, a lot of different parts of the different roles, and and you know juggling many balls as as mums are. So it it can make it you know sometimes within a team, you know if you do some in healthcare, if you look at teamwork, actually knowing your clear role within a team is one of the ways that makes the team more effective. You know, we kind of typically in medical emergencies, we do loads of training. So for a cardiac arrest, you know, someone's doing the timing, someone's doing the chest compression, someone's doing, and, and having those clear roles. And if everybody's kind of blurred in their roles, then it just descends into kind of chaos. And I, I guess you kind of see that a little bit with what we've done as a society to, to blurring the roles. And, and we've got to kind of work now work out how we sort of rectify that to an extent and still enable everyone to do all the different bits that they want to do yeah yeah it's fluidity and what what's the biggest thing that men come to, what's the biggest concern that men usually seem to show you when it comes to pregnancy i think a lot of men feel particularly early in the pregnancy that it's quite hard to bond or attach or even really believe that it's happening i think when you don't have those 
physical changes happening to you and there's obviously massive benefits to not having morning sickness or having an ever expanding tummy yeah. um but i think that also comes with you've suddenly got or in your mind you've got to do this kind of not 60 at birth of oh i didn't have a child oh my gosh now i love this child more than anything else and a lot of dads worry a bit particularly when they sort of first hold their baby that they're not absolutely smitten and there's not kind of heart emojis flying everywhere for, for the first time and actually what we what we can know from the science is that dads often take a little bit longer to bond with their child and the real sort of psychological elements sometimes don't come through even till about six months when dads again stereotypically but are often sort of involved in more rough and tumble play and you start to get more feedback but in the in the early stages it can be hard for dads because they aren't you know particularly if baby's being breastfed they're not necessarily involved in the feeding quite so much although there are lots of things you can do to help yeah. um yeah. You, so it, there's there is i think this connection thing that dads worry about that i think some mums struggle with as well but typically because of the physicality and the hormones they're kind of guided through that a little bit more and and have that slower progression through it as as pregnancy goes on whereas for dads it's it's quite a sudden suddenly give them this baby yeah 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 <laughs> um, and there's some quite interesting things you can do so they um, i think it's i think it's scandinavia they've started they've started doing these scans so the dad rather than just having your normal ultrasound just to check the baby dad's then given an, op an opportunity to talk to the baby whilst looking at them through the scan <laughs> through the ultrasound scan so they they have these dads who are singing to their babies and watching them kind of respond and you can see them move more if you're talking to them and yeah. explaining to them what life's like so the the idea behind it is that they're trying to help dads to bond with their child before they're before they're born and there's really good evidence that actually that helps not only theirs but also their partner's um, mental health yeah as, the pre as, as baby arrives kind of all goes full circle isn't it I yeah. think um yeah I think I can that I that when you can step into that role of the play thing but that's for ages away from when they're first born isn't it when they're kind of not doing a huge amount apart from feeding and sleeping and pooping and crying it's yeah funny. and hopefully then they are sleeping a bit more you're sleeping a bit more you feel a little bit better so I think you it is it, it can be the kind of perfect storm can't it the first yeah. few weeks or months of having a newborn baby yeah um, and, I, and I think you've got to go go easy on yourself I've had to remind both me and my wife that this time as well that you know you do just have to slow down again and kind of create that little bit of a bubble and it sounds like a cliche but actually no, you have to do that to look after yourselves I think when you've done it already and I, and I expect particularly when you're a doctor like you can kind of think oh well we know what we're doing this time and then find yourselves doing too much too quickly and I, I wrote when I had my third I wrote about pulling up the drawbridge and it was and I think it's very different probably for people who in the last year who've had babies because of the pandemic which has meant that choice has been taken away for lots of people but we I we really hunkered down with the third one and I realized that with my second I'd got out and about and done lots of things because I thought well I know what I'm doing this time and they've got a toddler that I need to entertain and and I and it but I felt very burnt out and I struggled most after my second I think because of that expectation with my third I really pulled up the drawbridge and and just focused on being at home and we just knew what we we didn't put ourselves under that pressure and you say in the book about um, you've got like do's and don'ts at the end of each chapter and a, a great one is about like when if she's feeding or however she's feeding if she's sat make her comfy you can make her comfy put the remote control within reach which my husband never managed <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, yeah, these things are all in theory as well yeah, my yeah, wife often yeah, reads yeah. the books like you didn't do that yeah you didn't do that, <laughs> but, but and a drink you know get the water going and all those things and that that nurturing which and it might be in the past that there were more women around who would have done that you know your family members or whatever and now they're not they're not there necessarily and I think um that's a massive role I think that men can play that just really helps take a load of stuff off the woman's mind yeah I think being sort of supportive with all of the practical stuff is really really important yeah um and emotionally as well and I, I even found things like um breastfeeding which obviously I'm no expert in uh, not having the right breasts to it but um I, I you know we'd before we had our first baby six hours and are exhausted and you know for the person who's given birth their vagina or their tummy's hurting and 
it's actually really useful to have somebody who hopefully can be a little bit calmer and just have remembered a few of those things about, oh, you could, maybe we could try putting a pillow here or why don't you put the nose here and the nipple here? And, and actually it's surprising how helpful you can be yeah. just because for mum, there's so much going on and they're so physically and emotionally drained yeah. that, it, you know, somebody just sort of, I'm sure lots of women would say that, you know, just kind of, forgotten how to do some of the basic things yeah. um, and just and just having that advocate and supporter there is really good so it's like in labor you know you can do as many hypnobirthing classes as you like but actually if you start having a big contraction or surge and you it's it, it, it can be painful even just to have somebody who you really trust there to say remember what you were going to do you're going to do this breathing i, I think that's really helpful and yeah. um, and reassurance as well i think because again you might not before having my first I wouldn't necessarily have thought even that breastfeeding might be hard and it just took a bit of time to get used to it and everything else but I think I don't I remember that my husband probably had no idea that it could be hard so even just knowing well it's going to be okay because you you know and we can get some help or it's, th it's that kind of just having somebody who's thinking logically when you might be going oh god it's not working what am I going to do yeah and it goes both ways doesn't it you know when I'm waking up at four in the morning and there's a dirty nap you're like what well, you know what, what the hell's going on yeah. it, it, it's, it's it, that's how you torture people isn't it you deprive them of sleep and and so it, it is a psychological roller coaster particularly for the first few weeks of having a newborn baby yeah. but if you if you've both kind of talked about it you have both well informed you both got some knowledge I think that's really helpful because as you say there's nothing worse than sort of suddenly getting to breastfeeding and assuming that it was all going to be a walk in the park and then and then that's when there's you know wrong wrongly but those feelings of sort of failure and things start to come in and then that's when people's mental health can start to fall down and, and you start to feel very anxious or start to suffer with some postnatal depression so and it's isolating as well isn't it I think it's that because when you're feeling those things because you because you might not want to see say to your partner I think I know of a few cases where uh, the, it's been the partner almost that's recognized the postnatal depression to say I don't think you're okay that's okay we'll find you know let's go and see someone or whatever because I think a lot of women are probably trying that's part of the problem is it's trying to be like oh I'm fine everything's fine I've got to be fine because this is what women this is what I do kind of thing yeah and I'd, I'd really encourage any partner you know, whatever gender whoever they are family member who's involved mm -hmm. if you're there and you think that that your the, the, the new mum is struggling with her mental health to raise that with the midwives or raise that with the health visitors you know even if it's just you know if they're coming you know now back doing more home visits than they could do in the pandemic to you know even just catching them on the doorstep and saying actually i'm really worried and they will be able to give you an idea with more information from you and your partner as to whether that's that's normal as you said you know sort of baby blues in the first few days of yeah. having a newborn are com like so common that almost every new mum goes through them yeah. but if that's really kind of persisting and becoming a, a big problem and having a big impact on their life then that might not be normal and that might be something that needs more support so just kind of talking to the healthcare professionals involved and, and and valuing your role as a partner as a birth partner you know advocating for your for your partner during the birth and afterwards as well and not feeling like you have to historically yeah okay dads didn't get up in the middle of the night and help change nappies but they also just kind of sat in the midwife appointments in the corner like a naughty schoolboy on a chair and you know, and now hopefully most healthcare professionals are actively encouraging dads to be involved because they know that that is good not only for the dad but also for mum and for the baby yeah yeah and I think in you one of the things you also mentioned in the book is about um visitors and kind of keeping them at bay and managing them and I think that again we totally missed that with our first until maybe about six weeks in where people would leave because we just I think we were one of the first among our friends to have a baby so it was just this like conveyor belt of people which I didn't know any difference we're like oh yeah that's fine and then people would leave and I'd be crying with exhaustion and it took a good few weeks to go oh, I don't need to do this, like hold them off or, or yeah, it boot them out after 45 minutes. Yeah, I think you don't, you don't want to overdo it. And it goes back to things like breastfeeding that actually there is a, it is a bit of a kind of science. And I think there's this, there's this myth, there's a very natural thing, of course, but there's this myth that um, mums and babies just kind of 
born to breastfeed and everyone yeah, knows yeah. what to do but everyone's got to learn so the baby has to learn and the mum has to learn as well yeah. and I've often found that actually you know just kind of lying in a really comfy bed and just shoving a baby on your boob doesn't really help very much so actually uh, we found certainly to start with until you kind of all got the swing of it that actually you know Ray wants to be in a comfortable chair with the cushions yeah. like this, the water here, the baby in exactly the right position. And you don't do those things if you've got mates around and you're sitting having a pizza yeah. on the sofa or well, whatever. You feed, do you do something stupid like feed from the wrong boob and realise, oh God, that one's depleted. <laughs> yeah. like you're getting all tangled up with what you're trying to do. And then you find that they haven't had enough food and then they start getting jaundice. And then, then, you, yeah. then you just, it's very easy to, it's kind of a bit like snakes and ladders, which makes it sound like an awful process. And, it, and it's really not, it's, it is amazing overall. But yeah. I think those sort of things are about that self-preservation, aren't they? And making sure that you, yes, of course, you want to introduce your wonderful new baby. And, and thankfully now, hopefully people can, because yeah. the pandemic's settling down, the vaccine's here. But I, I think you do need to just, be mindful that you want to keep that to quite short periods, particularly in the first few weeks. Yeah, definitely. Um, and is there anything, now you've had your second baby, is there anything that you would add to the book? Is there anything that you've kind of thought, oh, I've missed that out or anything like that? Um, I think, I suppose the, how you sort of manage that interplay between having a one and two and what you're going to do with them at the time of, you know, it's, it's just, the problem is you just never know when these things are going to happen. And, and in fact, we ended up having an induction for our second. And right. although we weren't particularly keen for that to happen initially, it kind of, when you look back, you know, like, well, actually it was quite good because it meant that we knew when we were going to go into the hospital, there wasn't this kind of 3 a.m. panic to where was Rory going to go? You know, she was able to go to my mum and dad's and, and be there. And it was all quite, felt quite controlled. Yeah. And, and you don't think of those sort of things until you're in that situation. Yeah. Um, and you, you've suddenly got somebody who's properly dependent on you um, and, and they can be a bit scared as well so I suppose there is there's an element of that which might be good to add in but I've also all felt quite strongly that I didn't particularly want to write a parenting book because I think once you've kind of got your baby you know, there's there's a very fixed sort of medical way that a pregnancy progresses and there are lots of different options along the way but yeah. essentially it's been the same for decades um, yeah. with a few um, few improvements in kind of pain relief and control and more yeah. open-minded thinking. But the, the, the element of actually parenting is not something that I felt qualified to tell anybody how to do. That has to fit in completely to your own lifestyle, yeah. Yeah. your own way, your own personality. And, um, it out, and, it, and it's different with each child as well, I think. Yeah, regardless. and everybody's going to do that completely differently and there is no right way to do that. They're, there is a safe way for a baby to come out. So um, that was why I was sort of happy to go in with the pregnancy and the first few for first few weeks of life. But I think after that and how you do that interaction between having a second baby and the first is going to be is going to be individual as well to the couple and the maturity of the child and all those sort of things. But it's definitely an area to think I, about if you're moving think, from one to two or, or more. Yeah, I think it's great. I think it's um, when you think of it in relation to mental health and the idea of, of the uh, uh, dad having more knowledge and understanding and everything else of everything that's happening and how that might make them feel, but the, how in turn that then makes their partner feel. It's it's makes complete sense that it's not something that you just shut away and go, oh, well, she's going to the appointments and she has all the information and that will do. So I think it's a really positive conversation for sure yeah and if you're you know high on gas and air whilst you're in labor actually you might not be in the best frame of mind to think about what so you know it's good to have had a sensible conversation with your partner beforehand yeah. about what you'd like to do as a as, as somebody giving birth and then hopefully they can sort of work with the healthcare team to enable that to happen as much as is, is safe but I, I always say to people you, you've just got to have you know, if you can have a plan in pregnancy and birth, but you've always got to have a plan B and C and, and also just accept that probably your plan will not be there by the end. And yeah. and hopefully you'll look back and think, actually, that was the best way to do it. I was guided appropriately. And you know, that's not everybody's story, sadly, but most people do end up looking back thinking, well, actually, you know, I've got a healthy, happy baby and I feel relatively okay at the end of this. So that was a good outcome yeah brilliant thank you so much for your time and, uh, no, really good to see you i'm 
glad you had a decent night last night. I hope you have lots yeah. more. <laughs> Fingers crossed for I tonight. Love Ray as well. Just Thanks so much. Doing a great job, however she's going. She's doing a grand job. No, she's yeah, she's being a trooper. <laughs>